All engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. What that essentially means is discovery, is advances, advances, questions, research, technology. Unbelievable. Without further ado, this is the Naked Scientist. Hello. And welcome to The Naked Scientist, the show where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, tech and medicine. I'm Harry Lewis and with me in the studio is the wonderful Julia Ravy. Coming your way in the next hour, why those of us born in cities like myself are worse at navigating, the muscle groups behind your puppy's friendly face and corals that are tolerant of warm waters, which we definitely need. And later in the show, well, first, do you remember this? An extraordinary incident at the Oscars ceremony when the actor Will Smith marched onto the stage and hit the comedian Chris Rock for making a joke about his wife's hair loss. But that won't be happening tonight when we bring you the Naked Scientists, Science of the Silver Screen Awards. You feel pretty safe presenting, don't you, Julia? Let's just say if anyone's getting slapped around here, it won't be me. Too true. The Naked Scientists podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. But first, a massive Omicron-fueled outbreak of COVID cases is sweeping across China. Alongside Hong Kong, Shanghai has seen a big upswing in cases, leading to over 25 million people returning to lockdown and businesses closing. But unlike in the UK, where there are hundreds of thousands of cases per week, China has just seen a few thousand in total. The difference is that China continues to pursue a zero COVID policy. Speaking with public health specialist Sean Griffiths, who was also involved in the original SARS outbreak in Hong Kong, James Titko began by asking why the Chinese and UK approaches to managing COVID are still worlds apart. That's to do with the choices of governments as to what strategy they're choosing in the UK and in other many other countries. In fact, the majority of other countries now, uh, we're adopting a live with COVID approach, which will allow cases of COVID in the community and will rely on vaccination to control the disease. In China and Hong Kong, it's a zero COVID approach. And that essentially relies on identifying cases, isolating them, isolating contacts and stopping the transmission of infection so that you don't have infection in the community. So it's just two sides of a coin. Do you think that this is a viable strategy for China moving forward? If you look at Hong Kong as an example, Hong Kong is a population of 7 million people and has currently got an outbreak of Omicron. They didn't concentrate on vaccination. They concentrated on the zero COVID approach of limiting the numbers of people coming into the country and controlling the numbers of disease. Unfortunately, once you get a very transmissible variant, such as the Omicron variant that's around at the current time, and an unvaccinated population, particularly the elderly, particularly those in care homes, you get a sudden surge in pressure on the health system and unfortunately in deaths. Am I right in saying that recently Hong Kong, although they've been following China's lead for much of the pandemic in trying to stick to a zero COVID policy, haven't they recently started to reflect on their approach a bit more and ease some restrictions? Hong Kong is changing its approach to COVID, although officially it's still sticking with a dynamic zero COVID policy. That's what Carrie Lam, the the chief executive, Mm -hmm. said only yesterday. At the same time, they are starting to allow more flights in because the economic impact on trade and by not allowing people into the country, by putting people who do go in, even um, returning Hong Kongers would have to go for into quarantine at one stage for three weeks. That was just having such a harmful effect on the economy. And if we look across to Shanghai, they had tried to be more liberal in the way that they were going to restrict and contain the population and then put in mass testing. However, uh, the costs are said to be in the billions for, for this exercise that they're going through at the current time. And do you think that slightly more flexible, perhaps more Western approach we're starting to see in Hong Kong might be a precursor for policy in China, perhaps? 
It seems that it's a political decision. And of course, they do have some important political meetings coming up. And reading around this subject, it would appear that uh, the general feeling is that they'll stick with zero COVID until after those political meetings. Unfortunately, they are seeing more outbreaks across China, major, most of the major cities. And living with COVID uh, policy allows you to carry on with your normal business. The zero COVID policy means that you have to stop people going to work, stop the transport systems, you test everybody. And that's a hugely difficult and challenging thing to do and does impact on the economy. So they are thinking of loosening up, but I doubt that it's going to be an official change yet. And I know you've talked about sort of the economic impacts. Was there any other knock-on effects that might have for us here? For us in the UK, it does impact on the cultural relationships, it impacts on social relationships. There are families who are are unable to get back together again. There are people leaving Hong Kong because they just can't tolerate the restrictions on their lifestyle because of the approach to COVID. Ultimately, zero COVID is going to be almost impossible for China. We've seen the organism mutate and mutate and mutate. And every time we get a successful mutation, we get an increased number of cases. The difficulty for China will be whether the vaccines they're using, which are homegrown vaccines, how effective are they as you get these continual mutations? It's going to be very hard to really cope with this. China does have high vaccination rates, although not as high in the over 80s. So there is a risk uh, of of that particular group who are more vulnerable to hospital admission being affected. Sean Griffith, she was speaking with James Titko. Now, how confident do you feel about navigating new terrain? Well, where you grew up, city versus countryside, could have a significant impact on your ability to do just that, according to new research published this week. Julia spoke to Hugo Spears from UCL about these results and took her own little unguided drive. Pretty dangerous. But for the participants in the experiment, virtual navigation was how they went about it. In this video game, you play a little boat by tapping left or right to turn the boat around and you just sail out over different waters looking for sea monsters to photograph them. It's generated data from more than 4 million people downloaded it and played the game. So when we have this large sample of people we can ask, you can actually start asking questions that might be quite difficult to get much of a result out of a small sample. This question of did you grow up in a city or a rural environment turned out to be an important question. And what we found, yeah, was growing up in cities was worse for your navigation skill than growing up in a rural setting. Okay, so I'm going to try and navigate my way home from work via King's College, which is in Cambridge, like one of the most iconic buildings, but not use the map to actually get there. I've only lived in Cambridge. I say only, I've lived here for like almost six months. I still don't really know my way around. I have to go out of here, turn right, at the roundabout, go straight on. Girton College, a beef eater traveller's rest on the right. Keep going straight, bed and breakfast. Right turn onto Mount Pleasant. So the next key result in our discovery was that you could predict the negative impact of the cities on a population. And we were able to do that using this metric, which is known as the street network entropy measure. But entropy is a mathematical measure to think about how disorganized a system is. So a system with low entropy is highly organized. So Manhattan, the grid layout in Manhattan, it has a very low entropy, but Sao Paulo, extremely high. The grittiness of the cities of a, of a country made a difference. That looks like a college to me. Whoop whoop! Get in college. Landmark one. We hit it. If you live in a city now, that's not the important question. It's did you grow up in one? And it's particularly gritty cities that seem to affect people's navigation. Oh, I'm way down the road now. I've missed the beef feeder, I missed the bed and breakfast, but I can see something called Mount Pleasant Halls. And I did have to turn onto a road called Mount Pleasant. Oh, I've completely forgotten what I'm meant to do here. That says no entry. Oh no. Okay, big field. I feel like I had to go round a big round a big field. Oh no. Across most of the lifespan on average, there's about a five year advantage. Fifty year five year old woman who grew up in a rural setting, she's doing as well as a 60-year-old woman who grew up in a city. 
And what are the implications of this work is that future cities being built, they may need to think about having some grid and some non-grid and exposing people to the different patterns of city layouts. One possibility is that the brain circuits that do the process space for us allow us to, to keep oriented and know where we are are adapting, they're changing how they operate, that they're expecting information about turns that are 90 degrees in a grid-like environment. But if you go into a, an environment where that expectation is not met, those neurons may not operate as optimally as they used to because they're used to working with information that has certain expectations built in. And so they make errors, and those errors then lead to navigational poor decision-making. I'm gonna go left here. Left. Oh, it says buses and taxis only. And there's cameras. I'm definitely not risking that. But I can see it from here. I can see it across the field. I think that's probably good enough, right? Well done to me, because I, I did get to the college. I just don't, can't physically get to it. Woo! Yeah, well done to you, Julia. That was Hugo Spears, and those findings were published this week in the journal Nature. From baffling British weather, the sideways spines of the vertebrae coming off here, to looking at a cheetah from the inside out, games making their way to the clinic, and what to eat in your garden. Mm. The Naked Scientists In Short podcasts bring you a top up of short, compelling science stories. Listen and download for free at nakedscientist.com/short, or subscribe to Naked Specials on iTunes. Now, a way to spot corals resistant to the phenomenon of coral bleaching, which is threatening reefs around the world, has been published by researchers in Australia. The aim is to find corals from among the existing population that are naturally better able to tolerate the higher water temperatures that are driving the problem, and use those to understand the basis of the tolerance and possibly seed threatened reefs with more robust varieties. But first... You've got to find them. And that's what the Mindaru Foundation's Kate Quigley has been able to do by combining good old-fashioned expeditions to the Great Barrier Reef with some machine learning techniques. Reefs around the world, and in particular the Great Barrier Reef, have suffered quite a lot of bleaching and mortalities due to global climate change and specifically warming due to global climate change. And when coral bleaches in that way, what's actually happening? Essentially what's going on is it's a disruption in a relationship. Even though a coral kind of looks like a slimy rock, it's actually an animal. And inside of that coral lives little algae, which are very similar to little plants. And these algae provide most of the coral's food. And so they use the sun to kind of go through some chemical processes, and then they give that sugar to the coral. The problem arises when water temperatures become too hot and they stay hot for too long. And this disrupts that relationship, causing the coral itself to go white. And if those conditions persist, the coral animal can eventually die. But not all corals are equivalently vulnerable. Is that what you're postulating? If you're saying I'm going hunting for corals that are more resistant to that, then it's not a level playing field. Some corals are intrinsically more tough that can survive increased temperatures. Other corals just seem to be less tough. So we're really looking for these tough corals. And is it the corals that are tough or is it the algae that are tough or is it both? It's both. So the coral animal is quite complex and some of this tolerance comes from the underlying DNA of the coral animal and some of the toughness comes from the symbiont and together they create the kind of response that we see on the reef. So how did you actually go hunting then in this Italy-sized hay sack? Some of the first locations were just, let's look for hot water. So I looked at hours upon hours upon hours of satellite data stretching over many years and kind of had some best case scenarios in terms of where we could potentially find these heat tolerant corals. And once I had these particular areas, we went on an expedition and we collected corals that were essentially reproductively ready. We wait for a few days after the full moon till the corals are ready to spawn. And then once they spawn, we collect eggs and sperm and we mix them in specific combinations to create 
new combinations of coral babies. And then we put those coral babies through a series of different temperature experiments where we can say, okay, these, these coral babies survive better under high heat stress, and then these survive less well. And what about the algae, the symbionts that, that are part of the equation as well? How do they get added? We gave them specific cocktails of symbionts that we were hoping would further increase their heat tolerance. That means at the end of all of our experiments, we could essentially identify which genetic combinations of corals were really tough and then which algal combinations were really tough. When you do that, what sort of enhanced tolerance can you endow these corals with? By doing this form of selective breeding, we were able to increase heat tolerance by three degrees Celsius. I should put that in there. Is that enough? Three degrees is a good start, but given the rate of warming, as well as the magnitude of warming that we're projected to see as soon as 2050, we're first going to need very strong action on climate change, even though these results are very promising. Is there any way to spot places where there might be even more resistant corals and even more resistant algae that could be brought together in the way you have and get an even higher temperature tolerance? Yes. So this was kind of the second part of our paper. We employed machine learning. Essentially, you can just stick all this data into an algorithm. And what it allowed for us to find was places around the Great Barrier Reef that fit the conditions that we had seen in our models. It told us that we needed to go to reefs that had high yearly temperatures We also needed to go to reefs that had experienced a particular level of heat stress in previous years, so we could get a value around that, and that we also needed to go to places that had lots of variability. So in any one given day, the temperature fluctuation was quite high, and with those three ingredients combined, that was essentially the perfect cauldron for producing heat-tolerant corals, and we were able to find locations on the Great Bear Reef that had this particular cocktail of scenarios. And that allowed us to find that about 7.5% of the, the reef area on the Great Bear Reef had these kind of refugia. Kate Quigley there, and that was published this week in Nature Communications. And finally, are you one of those people who can't resist your dog when they cuddle up and look you right in the eye. A new study identifies key anatomical features that may explain what makes those doe-eyed expressions just so cute. Harry spoke with Annie Burrows, who was in the room with her colleagues Maddie and Jade at Duquesne University to find out more. To you three, if you were to look at the face of a dog, what's the cutest part? For some reason, I've always liked dog noses. I just think they're so cute and moist, especially like when they're sniffing you. Um, I think the easy answer for me is when they give you the raised eyebrow look. Um, but I also am a sucker for when they give you a big open mouth grin. I guess I'm a little bit of the oddball here because I love dog ears. I love when they perk them up and lay them down when they're happy. I just think it's irresistible. I'm looking at a picture of Alfie, which is my brother's dog. Alfie's a golden cockapoo. He looks a bit like a useless lion. He's got these really exaggerated facial features, particularly his eyebrows. They really make his eyes stand out. And my whole family is in agreement that Alfie has the cutest eyes. And it's funny because we've spoken to Annie and our research team before about research they did looking at puppy dog eyes. And I asked her, should be kind enough to give us a refresher. That research uh, was an extension of some behavioral research that I worked on with a team that's primarily located in the UK, where they went into various dog shelters in the UK and filmed dogs when people were watching them. And what they found was that dogs that made that puppy dog eye face were more quickly adopted than dogs who didn't make it. So we we did some facial dissections to just see what we could find underpinning that movement. And we found that almost all of the domestic dogs that we sampled had the levator muscle that makes that puppy dog eye face, whereas none of the wolves had it. So it seems that somehow through dog domestication, 
people were subconsciously or consciously selecting for that particular facial expression. And your work hasn't stopped there. Between the three of you, you found out that these differences in muscle groups are actually represented in the whole face of dogs these days. All mammals that we know of have mimetic muscles that are dominated by fast twitch fibers. That's why you get tired holding a smile for your auntie who is asking you to keep smiling for the photos. <laughs> and that's because our face muscles contract quickly, but they get tired fast. But what we found was that both humans and wolves have a large minority of slow twitch fibers in these face muscles. Dogs, however, have a very tiny minority of slow twitch muscles. So if we think about what do wolves and humans do with their faces that dogs don't? Well, wolves howl. That's their primary mechanism of communication. And in order to howl, if you kind of try to make that face yourself, you have to purse your lips and hold that contraction. That requires some slow twitch muscle fibers. Humans use speech, and as part of speech, we move our lips in very specific controlled fashions that also require slow twitch muscle fibers. But dogs bark, and it doesn't really require much slow twitch movement. Annie says what this is indicative of is that really strong bond that we have with humans' best friend. And we shouldn't be surprised that we've selected dogs whether consciously or subconsciously, that do things that we appreciate. So wolves don't bark, but dogs do bark. And that's one of the key things that people look for in a dog is protection. But also it points to the huge emphasis that humans and dogs place on mutual gaze. This ability to attract one another's attention with facial expression and deepen that bond. Selective breeding for cuteness there with Harry and Annie Boros. The Naked Scientists podcast is produced in association with Spitfire. Cost-effective voice, internet and IP engineering services for UK businesses. Find out how Spitfire can empower your company at spitfire.co.uk. You're listening to The Naked Scientists with me, Harry Lewis and Julia Ravey. And now, for the rest of the show, it's lights, camera, action! Yes, roll up, roll up, dear listener, for the grandest of all prizes. It's the Naked Scientist Science of the Silver Screen Awards! You are joking with that. <laughs> do you like that? Uh, like is a maybe too strong a word. Do you want to hear it one more time? Because I spent quite a while doing it, an embarrassing um, amount of time doing this. Well, go on then. It's the Naked Scientist Science of the Silver Screen Awards! <laughs> I mean, it's professional. I don't think I'm going to probably make it as one of those voiceover artists, do you? Um, <laughs> we can maybe talk about this after the show. Uh, so we are taking it upon ourselves to look at the science behind some of this year's biggest films. And ultimately, we intend to dissect them and praise one film, only one, for being the most realistic through a scientific lens. Even if some of our choices seem completely ludicrous. Here to help us announce the contenders are some very special guests. Hello, this is Simon Mayer with Mark Kermode uh, and on the Naked Scientists on their shortlist for this year we have Dune, Encanto, Don't Look Up and No Time to Die. So here we go. Our first nominee is Dune. Mark. Uh, Dune is an adaptation of a very well-loved Frank Herbert science fiction novel series. It is set in space, an interplanetary, uh, intergalactic series of disagreements <laughs> involving centrally the House Atreides and lots of giant worms. Excellent. Next up, we've got Encanto. Encanto is an animated fantasy about a family with a magical heritage who take refuge in a in a place that is somewhere between this world and the next. Uh, next on the list, our third option is Don't Look Up. Uh, Don't Look Up is a parodic account of how it is that in America in particular, 
entire swathes of people can be made to believe utterly idiotic things by a president who is essentially a self-seeking evil idiot. Where did they get that idea well, I don't from? know. It's completely fictional. Uh, finally, No Time to Die. No Time to Die is the last Daniel Craig James Bond outing. It's a film which harks back to some of the themes of Honor Majesty's Secret Service. It was delayed forever during COVID, but when it finally arrived, it still managed to pack a surprise that nobody knew about. Uh, and that's the uh, the estimable wisdom of Mark Kermode. Yeah, cheers, guys. That's uh, Simon and Mark, Naked Scientist for one day and one day only. I bet you were loving that feel of superiority that comes with it. That's the short list. It's an eclectic mix. Again, Jules, just to stress this, we will be seeing which of these films is most plausible due to the science behind the scenes, right? Yeah, that's it. Gotcha. So first on that list was, of course, June. If you haven't seen June, and I've got a confession, I haven't seen it, so... I'm... Are you joking? <laughs> No, I haven't seen it. That's how that's outrageous. Yeah, well, we're here to judge this film, and here I am. I'm judging blind. But June, I've heard, it's a sci-fi masterclass, <laughs> and that's where the inhabitants are able to use their tech to breathe and fight on a sandy planet that would otherwise remain desolate. Otis Kingsman, who thankfully has seen June, he is reporting for us here. Most of the technology in the film is based around this fictional theory called the Holtzman effect. This in-universe discovery is described as relating to the repellent force of subatomic particles. Here with us to explain this a bit further is Andy Howell from hit YouTube series Science vs. Cinema. What exactly is this repellent force of subatomic particles? What on earth is that referring to? It's just a fictional construct to be able to justify all the fanciful, cool technology they have in Dune. But there are parallels in real world physics. You know, it's hard to put two charged particles together that have the same charge, but we can do it in the atomic nucleus because of the strong force. That's what allows protons to all really be stuck together in atoms. It's sort of efficient storytelling where you just say, well, you know, there was this real genius out there that figured out a bunch of cool stuff. Holtzman shields in the film are integrated into the armour of the soldiers and were designed to prevent fast-moving objects, like bullets and lasers, from penetrating it. However, it does allow slow-moving objects, like knives and more importantly, air, to pass through unharmed. Andy, is this something we can replicate using our own current technology? There's not a one-to-one -one parallel, but this is a clever way to justify having futuristic technology, but still having swords and, you know, not having bullets and things like that. But there are some things that are similar. There's a substance called oobleck, and that's just basically mixing cornstarch and water. If you smack it hard, it becomes a solid. But if you touch it easily, you, your fingers go right through. It's a liquid. I once filmed a TV show for National Geographic where we mixed up a big vat of this stuff, and I got to effectively walk on water. As long as I was running, I could stay on the surface because it was a solid. But if I stopped, I would sink down. The shield is often displayed as a blue, almost distortion to the wearers. But this goo, if anything, it's probably closer to the 1984 Dune film adaptation where it's just blocks of see-through jelly-like substances and shields surrounding their bodies. Sometimes we have shields on, say, a space station now, that's a physical shield, layers of material that are offset from each other so that if a particle comes through really fast, almost like a bullet, but there's, you know, just space debris out there, it'll get hit by the shield, break up. But you could have similar kinds of shielding for charged particles using just magnetic fields because charged particles bend in a magnetic field and spin around. And so in some cases, you want to shield electromagnetically. In some cases, you want to do it physically. And of course, we have things like body armor as well that can take away the kinetic energy of a fast-moving projectile and spread that out over a bigger area. So Dune is supposedly set 20,000 years in our future. In your opinion, how believable and how scientifically accurate is the science of Dune on a scale of 1 to 10? I don't know, 7 for believability, but I don't, I don't think you can condense it to 1 number because the goal of science fiction is not really to be accurate, it's to tell a really good story. But I believe that in telling a really good story, what you need to do is make something that seems 
generally plausible and fits within the boundaries you've set of that universe. That's exactly what Dune has done here. They've taken some plausible sounding things and have some technology that makes the story really, really cool, but they give you a way to write it off. I think that's ideal storytelling. Harry has brought into the studio, I don't know what it is. It looks like a plate covered in paper towels. This, you can take the napkins off the top. Have a good look. I'm scared. This is what he spoke about, Ublek. When you approach it at a fast velocity, or if you go in with a lot of force, it's like a solid. But if you're slower... It's um like a liquid. I mean, give it, get it nice and close so, to the mic, and then let me get it close. Give it so a slap. So I give it a good jab. So, oh, <laughs> are you joking? It's hard, isn't it? It's solid, but then if I go slow, I go slow. Are you oh yeah, I can sinking sink. Sinking in. I'm sinking in. That's amazing. Now my fingers are a bit gooey, like. But... Well, that's why you've got the napkins. That's oh but my goodness. There you go. If you want to be in the film June, go home and lather yourself in that, and you've got your How own body you armor. It? A bit of water, a bit of corn flour. We better move on to the next film. Next up on the roster is Encanto. It's a film in which each member of a Colombian family is gifted with magical powers when they become of age. I hear you. You're thinking science in a Disney film. Impossible. Or is it? Here's musicologist Dr. Alison Pawley, and she spoke with our very own Julia. I think it's all in how the musical is crafted. So Encanto does it so beautifully that as an audience member, I'm willing to go into that imaginative world because you are drawn into those characters so well. You know, there's that sort of well-known version of Les Mis where it's sung throughout the whole thing, all the dialogue. On the screen, for me, it it doesn't work as well. I can't go quite that far. (laughs) On the stage, I think it works a lot better. But on the screen, there's just a little bit too much of my logical brain interfering. One of the most notable things about the music in Encanto, I guess this applies to most animated films, is the fact that they appear to be singing off the cuff, but at the same time, they're all harmonising. That would be impossible in real life, right? Okay, so harmony in group singing can vary in the form it takes. And also it can vary between cultures. So in some societies, it's quite normal to sing in group harmony. In this country, if you sort of burst into a song in a supermarket, I'm not sure people would start joining in with harmonies. (laughs) But it might not be out of place in somewhere like South Africa, for example. Okay, how does that apply to Encanto? In We Don't Talk About Bruno, the characters are all singing their own melodies that you could Imagine maybe they improvised um, and they're all singing them layered on top of each other. So it is actually somewhat realistic that they could do that. Um, the chord sequence underneath is a is sort of the same for each of the characters' melodies. So it means that they can layer them all on top of each other and it works beautifully. It's something Lin-Manuel Miranda does in a lot of his music, this sort of layering approach, and it's very powerful and exciting when it happens. Right, and you've said the big hit there, we don't talk about Bruno, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's mine and Harry's favourite earworm at the minute. It's fairly believable. Is that partly due to where the film is set? Yes, so Colombia has a very rich musical tradition. It's known as the land of thousand rhythms. So one of the most popular is called Vallenato. In Vallenato, there's a tradition of vocal improvisation. They have sort of battles between two singers. So the sort of tradition of improvising vocally is sort of quite strong within that culture. And I think the opening number, The Family Madrigal, sung by Mirabel, that opening scene is very believable within Colombian culture, I would say. Go on then. On a scale of one to ten, how likely is it that Encanto is scientifically accurate? How likely is it that if people in Colombia burst into song, they would recreate something similar to the music we see in this movie? Ooh, that's hard. (laughs) Um... 
I'll be generous. Give it a six. <laughs> that is very generous. You get me up on a table any day of the week, but I'm sure most people are going to stand and stare at a flash mob rather than join in. Maybe Columbia is just made up of oddities like me. Why six out of ten? The opening number, like I was saying, if you had a very talented improviser, I would say that's quite believable. We don't talk about Bruno as sort of in between because everyone's improvising their bits to that hook that everyone can sing. You can quite plausibly learn. There's a moment in that song you have to suspend your disbelief when they sing, your fate is sealed when your prophecy is read. That is very un- unlikely that a group of sort of townspeople will have rehearsed that line and come together and sung it in that moment. <laughs> Great singing from both members of that interview. But I've got an issue with Alison. Do you? Yeah. What, what's the issue? Massive. It was her slating Les Mis. It touched a nerve. I haven't seen it on stage. so mm. But it is yet my favourite musical. If you've, got, if you've got the likes of Russell Crowe and Hugh Jackman, what more could you want? It is brilliant. I would say it's one of them. If you go into it as a film, they start singing and you go, when do they speak? You and I are going to have fisticuffs over the next one. What we- have we got coming up? Our third nominee is Don't Look Up. It's an apocalyptic black comedy where humanity finds itself in the headlights of a planet-destroying comet. NASA astronomer Amy Mainzer worked as the science advisor for the film and spoke to Otis Kingsman. Adam originally wanted the the object to be a much larger asteroid, something in the range of about 60 kilometers across, and and he wanted it to be an asteroid. uh, So so we we had to kind of come to a compromise on that. And I I had suggested that instead of an asteroid of that size, which is so big that uh, it really would be just absolutely hopeless to try to stop such an object, that we really wanted something that was, was smaller, still plenty large enough to cause a lot of damage, but small enough that we would have a reasonable chance of, of doing something about it. But basically anything that's in that size range, something larger than say about a kilometer across is big enough to cause what we would call global damage. Uh, and then also switching from an asteroid to a comet, there, there were a couple of reasons for this. One, uh, we have really at this point now mapped out most of where asteroids that get close to the earth in that size range are. So the really truly big ones, we know where, where, where most of these are now. But comets, on the other hand, come from much further away. And this particular class of comet, these long period comets can come from just absolutely out of the blue. We sometimes find them with only a few months of notice, uh, just like comet Neowise, which we discovered uh, in 2020. That object we found uh, just within a few months of its closest approach to the Earth and the Sun. So that's quite realistic. I suppose the temptation is to think that bigger is better. But as you've just explained, that's not always the case. That's one of the important things I think about uh, interacting with with a movie crew as as a scientist is that you want to bring enough scientific realism to the production that it doesn't pop you out of the story. In this case, of course, the comet in this movie is really an allegory for a lot of different kinds of global problems that we face as a society like climate change, loss of biodiversity, and even the pandemic. But, you know, in this case, we wanted to make the point that if everybody works together as a society, we actually can do something about these big global problems. It's not hopeless. Yeah, I didn't really question any of the science when watching it. I was I was too hooked. Take, for example, when Jennifer Lawrence's character first discovers the asteroid. I assume the maths and the formulae were accurate? In this case, in the movie, what you're seeing is a group of astronomers who actually don't study comets as their primary science objective. They, they, they study something else. And I think These are characters who, in their day-to-day lives, wouldn't calculate asteroid or comet orbits. So uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, he's a professor, he's got a bunch of students with him, he's he's trying to teach them and use use the discovery of the comet as sort of a teachable moment. And he's got to go look it up in a textbook, how to actually do this kind of math. It's not something he would do every day. So that's pretty realistic. If we actually had one of these comets heading towards Earth, would it be possible to redirect it as discussed in the movie? the single most important thing that we need is time. Uh, If we don't have a lot of time, it's much harder. Uh, So what you see in the movie is there's this huge worldwide scramble to launch spacecraft equipped with explosives that that can push the comet out of the way. That task is made considerably more complex in real life because it's very hard for us to build a spacecraft in less than years, realistically. And, and not only that, it's not just the time that it takes to build a spacecraft capable of deflecting the object, but 
your task, the energy that you require, your task actually gets considerably easier if you have more time. In other words, it takes less energy to push it out of the way if you can find it you know, years to decades in advance instead of just six months in advance, if you can even do such a deflection mission at all within six months. So time is really the most important thing. Sure, the closer to the Earth a comet, the bigger the deflection we would require. I mean, this all sounds rather well thought through. In your <laughs> unbiased <laughs> opinion, how scientifically <laughs> accurate is Don't Look Up? I would say this movie is about it an eight. It's pretty good. In terms of the presentation of the scientists in doing their best to discover the object and track it, figure out where it's going, and then let everybody know that there is a large and imminent danger out there to society and to the planet, that's very realistic. By the look on your face, I'm scared to ask this, but did you like this film, Harry? I've got a real issue with Don't Look Up. Okay, what's, what's the I, issue? I, it's satire about climate change, mm-hmm. but I have a real issue with how they portrayed the scientists in it. I understand that scientists aren't perfect. I get that, but the PhD student is very stereotypical. She kind of has this buzz cut, is in very baggy clothes. It is very aggy, and the professor himself is a bumbling idiot who gets his moment of fame but loves the attention all of a sudden after a while. And in a time when I feel like we should be supporting scientists, yeah, there's going to be a lot of people that disagree, so you're going to have to get in touch at the end of the show. Um, I just feel like we should be promoting it better. Next up, it's No Time to Die. Now, it centres around a bioweapon that can be tailored to an individual's genetic makeup. In the film, it's called Project Heracles. And here with us now to talk about it is sci fi journalist and author Cassidy Ward. Cassidy, what do we know about bioweapons at the moment? And is there anything out there that is similar to what we see in Bond? Yeah, so the, the short answer is no. We obviously do have bioweapons, they've been around for about as long as warfare has been a thing. But this sort of takes that to an extreme. We obviously also do have nanotech and we have gene editing capabilities. Heracles sort of imagines what we might be able to do if we had a perfect understanding of all of those fields and then put them to nefarious uses. This has absolutely been a concern for governments and for defense organizations for a while, sort of since the genetic age started. So it absolutely is. It's not the most far-fetched thing in the world. You spoke about nanobots there. This is something that we actually use at the moment in day-to-day life, is it? Yeah, not so much in our day-to-day lives. The robots you're likely to encounter in the day-to-day are good at like vacuuming your house or moving (laughs) parts on a factory floor. In terms of medicine, uh, nanobot tech is is certainly improving. Um, There was a recent paper published in the journal Science, for instance, that used injectable nanofibers to promote and enhance healing in spinal injuries. So the potential for nanobots in medicine is, is certainly there. There's something that we see quite a lot of in the news. It's the idea of personalised medicine. It's the use of how we kind of tailor treatments, and it's something that's really becoming big at the moment, to one's genetic disposition. This film sort of feels like it builds on that, but just following it down a different avenue, right? Yeah, absolutely. So gene therapy is an emerging field of medicine, uh, particularly for treating cancers and genetic diseases. The process sort of involves identifying a target gene and then modifying it in some way, depending on the specific circumstances. That might mean replacing a gene with a clean copy or turning it off altogether or adding a new gene. Um, Technologies like CRISPR have, have absolutely improved our ability to do that sort of work. Gene editing also allows us to create new therapies which have a wider audience than just one person. Uh, There was, for instance, a recent study involving spider silk proteins to modify a human protein called P53, which can put cancer cells into sort of a self-destruct mode. So yeah, No Time to Die sort of takes these capabilities and flips them on their head to ask the question, what if we use genetic technologies for violence instead of for therapies? Is there a chance that this is harmful for people? Because we get a lot of science from our entertainment, right? And so if we're crossing these wires, does that make it at all dangerous. Science fiction in particular has the ability to sort of imagine new futures. Um, and a lot of times those sort of prophecies become self-fulfilling. There's there's plenty of examples. Really, you know, we can only create a future if we can first imagine it. And we probably should be careful about the sorts of futures that we imagine. Yeah, it's a really interesting thought. I mean, one of the other key points in No Time to Die, and it is what results in Daniel Craig's James Bond's 
untimely death. Um, mind you, he is getting on a bit, so maybe I shouldn't have said that. He gets infected by the bioweapon and he's told by the, uh, the supreme arch nemesis that it isn't reversible. If we were to be infected by a bioweapon, is there a chance that it wouldn't be reversible? This was honestly my biggest gripe with the movie. First off, I think if the villain is telling you something, it's probably worthwhile to not take that at face value. (laughs) We're not given a lot of specifics about exactly how Heracles works, but I think it's reasonable to assume that something could have been done, that the bots weren't infecting Bond directly. They were sort of holing up in his body, waiting for their intended target. And I also think it's likely that the bots would have degraded in his body over time. You know, and Bond also had access to some of the most advanced technology and brilliant minds in the world. If if anyone could have fixed it, it's probably Q. I think Bond was just being a little dramatic. And just finally, you know, if you had to give it a score, how scientifically accurate, albeit hypothetically, is Project Heracles and James Bond's No Time to Die? If I were to put Project Heracles in today's world, I'd have to give it a five or a six. It's it's built on a foundation of real science but it asks the audience to take some pretty big leaps of faith in the way that it works. If we push the timeline forward a little bit, that score very likely would go up. I don't think it's impossible, but I do think it's unlikely, which is great because this is probably one of those cases where we don't want life to imitate art. Sci-fi driving the science in, in the real world a little bit. Thanks there to Cassidy Ward. Now, Harry, you and I have to have a deliberation here about what film we think is deserving of this so prestigious award. So let's hand the reins back over to one of our producers, Otis, who I believe has just finished catching up on the titles himself. There go the credits. That's the last of the films. We're taking a different spin for our award ceremony compared to the Oscars. I think before we get on with the prize giving... I better find someone who can help us run a critical eye for our selection. One show that has definitely got scientists and science fiction enthusiasts hooked for over 50 years is Star Trek. Unfortunately, I have Erin MacDonald on hand, one of the scientific advisors to Star Trek itself. I started off by asking her, at what stage of the movie making is it that a real scientist gets pulled in to help? So sometimes I'll have discussions with writers when they kind of have an idea for a film and they just want to bounce some ideas around with like maybe how the engines can work or maybe how the space station could work. Um, But sometimes I get brought in late in the day when they have a draft of a script and they're like, we'd really like eyes on this as a scientist. And so, you know, it's like this improv philosophy of someone comes to me with some wacky story about time travel and music and sound in space and disastrous space aliens. And my job is not to say, no, that'll never work. My job is to say, okay, cool. Like, let's try to see how we can make that happen. Erin tells me that the most important part of her job is ensuring that the audience remains engaged with the cinematic content. That means it can't necessarily be too wacky. Depending on the film, it might even need to adhere to general scientific principles. In short, there needs to be a set of rules. That can mean a lot of work for a really small feature in the show. Sometimes we'll build up tons of scientific backbone for the story, and then that gets edited down to like one line of dialogue. (laughs) And so you just want to make sure that when they're doing that, that it's not interrupting the actual flow and the cadence or anything else like that. And sometimes, after all of our efforts, it can be best not to mention any of the hard work at all. So you can look at an episode of Star Trek Lower Decks, for example, that will have like the strange energies that possess, you know, the second in command, and then he becomes a godlike creature. And as soon as like you try to explain it, then you start to lose the audience. And so a lot of times I say to writers, okay, that's really cool. Let's do it. Let's just not explain it. Erin says that scientific inaccuracies, which tend to throw people off, are fairly easily avoided if you take the time to build up a portfolio of the likely audience and understand your genre. A lot of it is just the basic knowledge that people have. One that comes to mind is sound in space, because everyone knows the tagline, in space no one can hear you scream (laughs) from Alien. And so anytime you have sound in space, that will pull people out. But you know, one where we do break it and it doesn't pull an audience out, I like to say is the beginning of The Martian. 
the whole inciting incident of the Martian with the big windstorm that's knocking the ship over and blows a satellite dish into Mark Watney, that would never actually happen on Mars because the atmosphere is way too thin to actually physically blow an object like that. But not a lot of people know that, and so it doesn't pull them out of the film. And without that, there wouldn't be a story. In fact, the audience itself has a huge influence on how much scientific language, fictional or not, is used, along with how scientifically accurate the film needs to be in general. With Star Trek Lower Decks, you know, that's an adult comedy audience, and so we're not worried much about science at all. My job in that aspect is just to make sure we don't say anything wrong. But then, for example, we also have a show called Star Trek Prodigy, which is aimed at children. And so for that, it's not just getting the science right, but explaining it in a way that's almost educational. It feels strange to think that there are Star Trek shows which go easy on the physics. Now, I'm not a Trekkie, but I do happen to know one. Chris Smith loves all of it, so I spoke with him a little earlier to find out why he loves boldly going where no man has gone before. One of my fondest memories as a child was being taken to see Wrath of Khan at the cinema by my dad. And it was actually one of the first times I'd ever been to the cinema, which made it special, but I just loved that kind of movie. But the thing that really makes Star Trek stand the test of time, in my mind, is that those technologies that they had in the early days were things we all wanted but never thought we would have and now we have we've got mobile phones well those were their communicators we've got ipads and tablets well they had those as well they had that big screen gps navigation system well that's in everyone's car these days and then there are other things like mri scans to produce those amazing detailed body scans And the Enterprise even had smart speakers. And here we are today, talking to our Alexa and Google devices in the same way that people in the next generation used to touch their badge and ask the computer something. And we all rolled our eyes and thought, oh yeah, that'll never happen. And here we are. I think it's an amazing series. I will continue to love it to my dying day. A true Star Trek fan is our Chris, summing up the scientific plausibilities we see on the TV. But before I hand it all over to Julia and Harry for the final verdict... I wanted to share some more of Erin's wisdom. I had her look over our four nominees, and she was quick to point out that each one needs to be approached from a different perspective. I love your selection of movies because it really speaks to your attitude going in as a viewer. Like, for example, when I went into Encanto, I was not there to scientifically analyze (laughs) the plot of Encanto, but it's really fun to use something like Encanto to teach science or to introduce scientific topics that we haven't seen before. And when you're talking about James Bond and using nanobots, again, that's something that you go into wanting to watch an action film. And James Bond has that long legacy of weird, cool technical devices. So you're more willing to let those things go. When it comes to don't look up, I might go in kind of curious about that asteroid, but I'm really watching it to try to see how people are going to react to an asteroid that's coming to kill the Earth. And then, of course, I'm saving the best for last because Dune, you go in and you're like, oh, this is hard sci-fi. Like, this is science fiction that's really detailed, really thought out. And so you go in kind of expecting to have your mind blown with new scientific phenomenon or idea that you might not have had before. But it's really just such an, a cool way of having us see the potential in our universe. Thanks, Erin. That's given us a lot more to think about, hasn't it, Harry? Yeah, I think it's funny because we started off looking at how the science makes something more plausible. Yeah. And actually what we need to take into account is what the audience is expecting going in. Like Aaron said, in Canto, you're not going in expecting anything other than people to be dancing and singing. Okay, so... A quick run through of the films because we need to give out this award, taking into account the audience as well. Yeah. Okay. Can sure. I start with James Bond? Go for it. Go for James first. Um, I have an issue because there's this biological weapon, and I do come from a biological background. I get that, but it was just too unbelievable for me. Yeah, I completely agree. As a biologist background myself watching that film that put me off not that what about Encanto Encanto love it in terms of like the science as we were speaking about getting up and singing I know other people wouldn't be as inclined and I feel like if you're going into that type of film and thinking it's real there'd be a lot of people who'd be like nah yeah you take it with a big pinch of salt third up 
Don't look up. I'll mm. steal this one. I think I've already said my piece on it. It's a nice concept. We're trying to, again, talk about climate change, talk about the fact that perhaps people in power aren't doing enough and they're not listening to those who have more information to tell them and help facilitate change. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, maybe it's just too on the nose for me. Yeah. And, and that means that what we're left with is June. June. Good old <laughs> classic June. I mean, I am not smart enough, in, I'm not smart enough full stop, but in any capacity to do subatomic physics. And I like it because also... It's science fiction, so it's allowed to be completely out there. But what they do is they build scientific principles and then the rest of the film has to adhere to them. So they've done it the opposite way around. Yeah, no, I feel the same. It's like they've got their rules. They stick to them throughout. Even if their rules aren't necessarily realistic in our world, they're realistic in that world. Does that mean that our prestigious TNSSA? Yeah, June's got six Oscars, but go on, let's give it a seventh awards, the most important one. Oh, I say, how civilised. Well, thank you very much. I am so honoured for this well, award. All of those people, and obviously the whole of the June cast, is listening into our show Yes. for the final verdict. Congratulations. The TNSSS Award is yours. And that's it. The names are up in lights. And if you want more of that kind of action, you'll just have to join us again next year, won't you? But hold on a second. We're not done quite yet. We do have a little bit more hard science for you to sink your teeth into with our question of the week where we answer the questions you've been sending in. Otis Kingsman was solving this mutation mystery from Malcolm. How can we identify a disease? When looking at a sample of chromosomes, what are scientists looking for to spot a disease gene? Well, what indeed? When infected with a new disease, it's imperative for scientists to know exactly what it is in order to find the best cure for it. So how do they do it? Here to break it down is Jocelyn Pearl from Tune Therapeutics and host of the Lady Scientist podcast. When we're trying to identify a disease from someone's genetic sequence, we have to compare two different sequences. Think about your chromosomes like a library of books. And the hunt for a disease gene is like looking for a book where an important word or sentence is different from the reference or correct version. And this difference impacts the transcription or the translation of that gene in such a way that it causes differences to the amount of a given protein or the function of a protein. Changes to the genetic sequence of a gene are called mutations. We can read these out using sequencing technology. One common way that we look at the genetic sequence is using a method called Sanger sequencing. We get a readout for the four base pairs of DNA called nucleotides. And these are represented in that sequence information as letters. Those letters are A, T, C, or G. Each group of three nucleotides within a gene represents the codons of that gene, and that's what gets translated into amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. These proteins are the instructions for all sorts of processes within our bodies. When a disease is present, it leads to a mutation occurring in the codons in the protein. The disruption in the transcription or translation of a gene can change the function of the protein or the amount of that protein in a person. In sickle cell disease, the gene that encodes the protein beta hemoglobin is mutated. And this mutated gene makes a person's red blood cells form a sickle shape and they cannot carry as much oxygen around the body. So Malcolm, scientists identify disease genes by looking for mutations in the DNA sequences. If our codons aren't correct, then it will affect the function of our proteins and lead to illnesses and problems within our body. Thank you to Jocelyn Pearl for clearing things up. Next week, we'll be charging headfirst into this question from listener Barry. Would a car battery's maximum capacity decrease over time like that of a phone battery? If it's like my phone after a few years, I'll be able to drive about five minutes before needing a charge. We'll learn more about that next week. Send in your questions to us at chris at nakedscientist.com and we will try to solve them for you.
And that's it for this week. Next time, we'll be hearing about the mysterious cases of cancers that can spread between animals in certain species. If you haven't a clue what we're on about, then you better tune in next week to find out. The Naked Scientists come to you from the University of Cambridge's Institute of Continuing Education. It's supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Harry. That was Julia. Thanks for listening. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>